Thanks very much, Malcolm, and thanks also to the Center of Excellence for inviting me to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that Ames has been doing in some of the more remote areas of northern Australia. So this talk is, is um, a bit of an overview of some of the work that Ames has been doing, and particularly the people that are um, on the, uh, the title page here. Um, just a quick word of introduction. Ames, to many people, is synonymous with research on the East Coast and the Great Barrier Reef, but for the last 15 years, We've been increasingly doing work in, in the northwest of Australia. Um, we now have a, an office here in Perth with about 20 to 30 people doing work uh, from Ningaloo uh, Reef uh, up to the, the Northern Territory border. And we also have a small office in Darwin as well. The dots you see on the screen are, are an indication of the last 15 years where at one time or another we've done a sample, um, at least a sample if not a full survey. So we have been up there for quite some time, but this graph can be a bit or the picture can be a bit misleading in the sense that there is still a vast amount of information, a vast area that we really don't have a good handle on. And so what I want to talk to you about is one of the key habitats which I think has been neglected, and that's the deep reef. So traditionally, um, coral reef biologists tackle the shallow emerging coral reefs. And in the northwest, uh, there are some really prime examples out in the ocean area, oceanic area, the, the Rowley Shoals, Scott Reef, and Ashmore and Cartier, and they have received a great deal of attention over the last several years. But in fact, there are other major domains which are very poorly described, and, and that first oval you see on the top shows an area of, of more submerged reefs that don't ever emerge, um, and they have been very poorly studied. And the other area that's been very poorly studied and neglected is the inshore uh, fringing reef areas out of the Kimberley. Now, for the offshore areas and some of the deep reefs, one of the reasons, the primary reasons why they are neglected is because a lot of our work has been done on scuba in the last 50, you know, 30 or 40 years, perhaps 50 years. This gives you a graph of the typical dive depth frequencies that you find at the Australian Institute of Marine Science. It's probably very similar to a lot of other places. You really don't get that many surveys, that much work done below about 18 or 20 meters. So really, it's been, to some extent, a technical issue that, that has prevented us from doing a lot more work on some of these deeper habitats. Now, in the inshore, there are other issues in the inshore that prevent us from doing a lot of work. I'm not going to get into those at the moment. I'm going to concentrate on these offshore deep reefs. Now, if you wanted to get down into these areas beyond normal diving depths, a little while ago, you needed to get into some, some he fairly heavy industrial equipment, and you had to have big boats to go with that. And so, you know, there was a big issue in terms of how do we get in there and do sort of remote surveys in really deep areas. Um, these days, with, with modern technology, we have um, uh, the ability to, um, to uh, use much smaller portable ROVs um, and through the ingenuity of, um, uh, of uh, field biologists and digital cameras, you can actually start doing things like you know, dropping cameras down into the deep ocean. So you can do a lot now uh, of surveys without having to get wet and go down and, and dive. And we can therefore do a lot of work on, on the deck of a ship um, and, and get a lot of the information, which is ultimately very, very similar to what we would get from, say, the long-term monitoring program we're doing on the Great Barrier Reef. So just a, a bit more of an example, these are the kinds of towed videos which we can now deploy off a smaller ship. Um, we can then get real-time video back on the deck of the ship. We can then create sort of habitat maps which are, are, are actually near, near real-time, showing through different color codes here, the different types of communities which we've estimated, and then through uh, analysis of much more high-resolution stills, we can get a good idea of what the actual community composition is in a very similar way to, we, to the way we analyze stills in shallow water on coral reefs. So we're now really in a position where we have the technology to go into these deep areas and find out, well, what's, what are they like? Now, that's in terms of the benthos, but also recently we've had uh, baited remote underwater video systems, which Ames has helped to develop, which can be deployed very easily. They're just a, a boy with a, uh, sorry, a, a frame with a video camera, a, a baited bag here, and you can just record any of the fish that come around. So you can do mobile fish censuses remotely in deep water as well. And that's, again, made a big difference in terms of what we can do. Uh, and even further, um, uh, important modification to this is using stereo browse, where by using two cameras, you can actually get length estimates and then biomass as well. Um, finally, another uh, interesting device that's been developed um, in collaboration with other people at Ames, 
um, is the, the ability to sort of really assess biodiversity um, uh, autonomously without having to do surveys, and particularly some of the biodiversity of the smaller uh, invertebrates, which are very important in coral reef environments. And uh, while this one has been actually put in place by a diver, you could easily deploy these um, just through um, uh, lowering them down with a proper anchor on, onto, onto some of the deeper areas of reefs. So we do, we do now have a lot of techniques to be able to get into these lesser known areas, but the effort is still very small. Nevertheless, what I'd like to do is show you a little bit about what we've been doing so far in two deep reef habitats. One is, is in the Scott Reef uh, Deep Lagoon, where we've been doing a lot of work over the last 10 years uh, with, with support from, from Woodside. Uh, Luke Smith will tell you a lot about the work we've been doing on the shallow reefs, but uh, we've also done a number of surveys in this deep lagoon, which is uh, down to about 50 meters depth. And I'm just going to show you a couple of very brief uh, slides that talk about some of the results and also give you some visuals about what kind of communities you can see down in these really deep areas. So they are dominated by platy corals to a large extent, but, or, or, or um, uh, yeah, mainly plate form corals. Some of these corals are actually uh, unique or specialists for deep water, but you also get quite a large number of corals that are also found in shallow water as well. And the coral cover can be quite rich in spots. So just to give you a bit of an idea of the kinds of communities, the kinds of you know, benthic um, habitats we see, there's areas of very rich coral cover, areas of high algae. There's a whole suite of different corals that you can see. And these are all largely done by either um, uh, remote camera or ROV, these pictures. And you know, to conclude, basically, um, what we found is that there are some deeper water specialists here but there are significant numbers of species that occur across both the shallow and the deep. So out of 42 sclerocrian species between 40 and 70 meters, 34 of these are also known to occur at shallow sites. Um, and the, the Bruv's deployment also indicate that um, you know, 159 fish species have been seen by divers on both the, on shallow water uh, sites uh, as well. So uh, in a sense, there are similarities between these deep and shallow areas, which does give some support to this idea of these deeper areas being refugia of biodiversity uh, for uh, perhaps uh, adding uh, resilience to some of the shallow areas in terms of sources of recruitment after damage. I don't want to overstate that case, but there is clearly some argument for that. Um, the other graph I just want to show here is that, that clearly there, there, there is not a huge decline in either sort of one of the major algal uh, groups here or in hard coral as you go over depth. There's a decline in coral diversity. The cover is not actually declining that much overall across that lagoon. Um, just to give you a bit of a, a, a quick summary slide on some of the other work that we've done, looking at photophysiology and genetics and connectivity between the deep and shallow reef as part of the, uh, the Scott Reef project that we've done with Woodside. Um, the, uh, the key findings here is that looking at you know, the um, genetics, we found that there is um, um, only limited connectivity, but there is some evidence of con connectivity, at least for one species, between the, uh, the deep and the shallow areas, which gives some hope for the idea of them being potential refugia in the future for recolonization of shallow areas. Um, there's a range of adaptation mechanisms so that they, they do, um, uh, uh, the shallow water species, species that are found in shallow water, are able to adapt to these deeper areas through a combination of the uh, zooxanthellae uh, increases or changes in the amount of chlorophyll uh, and the, the, the photobiology of the, of the organisms. Um, one of the clear conclusions, however, is that water clarity is absolutely essential for maintaining these deeper areas, and that's something that needs to be taken into account as we think about you know, a few of the future developments in the, in the entire region, basically. Um, the other thing that's, um, I think, quite exciting is that with the, um, um, uh, through the IMOS, Integrated Marine Observing System, and the uh, Center for Field Robotics at the University of Sydney, we're beginning to now start using uh, automated underwater vehicles, untethered, to be able to go back and do uh, long-term monitoring of specific sites at Scott Reef. So we can go now. We haven't got any results yet, but we've just started a long-term monitoring program where we're going to be able to go go back and revisit specific transects or quadrats and then reassess them over time to look at, see what's happening in, in, um, in terms of changes over time. Um, I'd like to now move on to um, the other sort of deeper water habitat, which is far more extensive than just the Scott Reef Lagoon, and that's the, the entire habitat that you can see along here, these, these small little dots against the dark blue background. So we have an extensive continental shelf, flooded, flooded uh, sort of coastal area, basically, 
and, and these pinnacles that come up from quite deep water. And they are all, in a sense, drowned reefs. And there's, there's a variety of hypotheses, but they seem to be getting deeper as you go. So there's been perhaps general subsidence through there. But they represent, in a sense, a very important bioregional area, and perhaps even, in fact, a biogeographic domain that has been very poorly studied and, and very poorly recognized, I think. Um, if you do a, a quick analysis that color codes the depth um, by, by color, you can see that there's really quite an extensive area here that is, uh, that is above about 60 meters, and therefore is in the photic zone and actually does support quite rich coral communities. So basically, we've got over 900 kilometers of these shoals going down there. That's, you know, not as big as the Great Barrier Reef, but it's very extensive in terms of linear extent at about 2,000 square kilometers of actual reef area. So it's quite a significant habitat, very poorly studied as of, as of yet. But we have done some surveys for a variety of reasons. The uh, oil and gas industry has done some surveys. We've done some surveys for the oil and gas industry. And so what I'd like to do is just give you a bit of an idea of what you might see on the tops of some of these shoals that vary between about 20 meters to about 50 or 60 meters. And uh, there was a bit of a feeling that perhaps these areas were really quite depauperate of, of benthos. Uh, they weren't all that significant from a biodiversity point of view. Uh, I'd like to sort of reassure you that there's, while there are areas as on any coral reef where you can go over rubble fields or sand, there are areas of really quite rich benthos, including soft corals. This is a, a huge extent of, of um, fungia corals covering several acres on, on one shoal. Um, you can get extensive beds of seagrasses covering, again, major areas. Um, and you get you know, scenes like this down at, at you know, 30 or 40 meters. Not surprising. If you went down to a normal coral reef on the Great Barrier Reef, this is what you wouldn't be surprised to see. But what is perhaps important to note is this is what you can see on all those shoals as, uh, in, in that entire area across 1,000 you know, kilometers um, that have been poorly studied and, and need to be properly recognized as being very important for, from a management point of view. Um, again, just some views, you know, the soft corals, you can get outcrops of hard coral. Um, again, the same sort of thing. This looks very much like a typical reef. In a sense, it is just a typical deep reef. But let's, let's, let's be clear, there are areas where you don't get very high coral cover, uh, where you get lots of uh, coralline algae, uh, rubble, and sediment. Now, let's look a little bit about, uh, at a couple of small studies we've done on a couple of shoals, just to look a little bit more quantitatively about what, what we can see. Um, this shows the results from a video analysis um, at, um, at uh, Vulcan Shoal. And uh, again, shows the various different habitats. We've been able to, not only with this video, uh, map out through video classification the different habitat types. This is just subjective classification. But then using these video stills, actually um, record coral cover in a, a number of important categories. And the results are interesting for a variety of reasons. First of all, what we found is that you can get areas where there's really quite high coral cover. But this is for one shoal, looking at various transects. And you can see there's a lot of variability from one part of the shoal to the other. Perhaps not that surprising. That's what you find on reefs as well. But here you can clearly get up to about 25% coral cover on, or 30% coral cover on one transect, but quite low on others. Again, something like seagrass can be really dominant in one area, but almost absent in, in, in other areas as well. So a lot of spatial variability within a shoal. Also, spatial variability between shoals. So here's, say, Barracuda Shoal and Vulcan Shoal. And you can see that in some areas, for instance, you get this huge amount of uh, soft coral here in one transect, which is really sort of sh shifting the overall average for this particular reef. You can get algae and seagrasses uh, bumping up and down along this, but creating much more seagrass in this one shoal compared to this other one. So there's a lot of difference within shoals. There's a lot of difference between shoals. And we don't understand exactly what's driving those kinds of changes. We need to do a lot more work over a much bigger area over time, looking at processes to get a better handle on all of this. Um, so basically, the message here is that you know, these areas, this big area here of, of submerged drowned reefs are, in the, are a significant but poorly described bioregional asset with high spatial variability, which needs to be understood better. And there is the potential that these do represent reservoirs of biodiversity and a source of resilience for shallow reefs into the future. They are worthy of a lot more work. Um, now, what I'd like to do is just finally end up on a uh, five. OK, I'll go. This is the last few slides, anyway. End up with a few thoughts about some of the challenges facing these areas before we've even had to 
ha had a chance to look at them. So first of all, everyone knows about the Montara oil spill. It happened right in, in this basic area where all these shoals do occur, right, not, not necessarily right in the middle, but close to a few, such as Vulcan and Barracuda. This map here shows the, the uh, exposure probability or, or um, uh, frequency of oils either from models or from actual sightings uh, over the entire peri period of the spill. So clearly in the areas where it's red, there was oil 100% of the time going down to about 0.1% of the time here. But what you see is, and it doesn't take necessarily that much time for oil to start to impact on certain organisms. So you've got a radius of about 100 kilometers over which there's a potential impact from one major oil spill. But keep in mind that this is just one well out of hundreds of wells that, are ex that exist in this area of very high prospectivity, high productivity for oil and gas. So what's interesting is that in, in, as a result of the, the, the Montara inquiry, there was a, um, a requirement that is now occurring in, in, um, uh, from the government for people applying for uh, licenses and permits to, to operate that there should be an impact statement that includes an assessment of a, a, an oil spill lasting for 77 days. No coincidence with that number. It's how long Montara lasted. Um, and, and what can happen in 77 days? How far can things go? Well, here's an example. Now, it might be an extreme example, but this shows you know, the limits of what you could, you could find happening to a patch of oil floating on the surface after 77 days. This shows what happened to a drug that was released by Ames over here, and after 70 days, where did it end up? Way over here. Now, look, the province I'm talking about here is just, just like that, so where all these submerged shoals are. So clearly, in 77 days, any spill has the potential to at least drift over um, almost all, any of the shoals in this entire region. We did a quick analysis to, in a sense, demonstrate you know, the, the importance of this, which is to say that if you look at each of these, uh, these dots here, which are oil wells, and you say, let's, let's assume the worst case scenario and that there's a, uh, a, an oil spill a bit like Montara, say there's 100 kilometers where there might be a, a reasonable frequency of seeing some oil on the surface. And then we can say, well, look, we'll, we'll color code it by how many different wells might be affecting any one place in here. And the interesting conclusion of this, I think I'm, I'm losing my laser, is that in many of the areas, there's at least five different companies whose activities could potentially um, impact on these areas. So uh, one of the conclusions here is that there's a, 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 a need for there to be an industry-wide and, and, a, and a regional approach to all this because individual impacts from each company are overlapping with everyone else's, in a sense, impact footprint. And so some coordination would make a lot of sense as far as we, we feel in this point of view. Now, um, the other thing that's interesting is if we look at what's going on in terms of management right now. So the, the bioregional planning process, there's been a, um, a, a document now produced that has suggested a number of marine parks for this area. And it's very interesting that there have been two parks proposed that are called Oceanic Shoals Parks. One in the, in the northern region, one in the northwest. So they're, in a sense, uh, divided. So these are these two Oceanic Shoals Parks. Now, there's a few things that are worth mentioning. And I don't want to sort of say, pass any comment about the adequacy of these right now. I just want to make a few points. First of all, if you look at these areas that are shaded by green, there's two things that are worth mentioning. First of all, that seems to be where a lot of these shoals exist. It's not where the parks are, are located. In fact, you can see these boundaries neatly skirt the boundaries of these green areas. These green areas are areas where there is joint jurisdiction between us and either East Timor or Indonesia. So at this stage, the, the, the whole bioregional prowling process and, and proposals for marine parks has actually excluded these areas, because they are complicated, they're joint jurisdictional, they involve in, in, uh, other nations. And the same is true of this area, which is the MOU box, including Scott Reef, Ashmore, and Cartier. So they're not even in Australia's current bioregional planning process in terms of, of figuring out where to put marine parks. Um, and, the other, and, and so I think that's really important because it's restricting our ability in terms of planning to be able to really address what I think is, is a very important biogeographic domain, one that needs more work, but one that really needs active management as well. So that's the only you know, sort of comment I want to make on that, but I think it is something that, to me, suggests that a lot of work is done, needs to be done in this area, and it shouldn't be done piecemeal. We should be treating this as a biogeographic region. We should be thinking about a regional baseline, 
a strategy and, and developing a, a strategic approach to say, like, how would we really characterize that area? Let's not wait for individual impact assessments or individual studies commissioned by, by the government to, to slowly put together piecemeal a picture of what's going on in this area. Better to think about the entire area from the beginning, develop a strategic plan for how you would assess it, and how you would understand its function. So a baseline regional study, from our point of view, is not about saying what's there. It's about how is it changing, why is it changing, how resilient is it, how could we predict what might happen under different scenarios of human use. So we believe this would result in a much more efficient uh, and robust understanding of this area, and, and we're very keen on, on seeing that you know, pursued in the next few years. So that's it. Thank you.